man like a tree is nourished by his roots. His roots grow in different parts of the world. The branches of his family tree spread out over thousands of years and kilometers. But he considers himself a son of the Kazakh land, the land where the nomads of the Great Steppe reached the highest goals. Arman Umarkojev, traveler, historian, archaeologist in the new season of the Kandala project. There are many legends about Noah's Ark, and several countries, including Kazakhstan, claim to be the place where it docked. There is a sacred mountain called Kazigurt in the southern part of our country, where, according to a local legend, Noah's Ark was brought to by the waves of the Great Flood. Incidentally, there is a connection of Noah's Ark to another legend about the making of felt. When Noah and all those he wanted to save were already in the Ark, loud thunder broke out in the sky and streams of water poured down. All the animals, including the sheep, crowded together in a great flock, pushing one another, and the wool fell from the sheep in tufts, which the flock trampled with its hooves. When the flood was over, the Ark docked and the animals came ashore. Noah saw that the entire deck was covered with a thick wool carpet. That's how felt came into being. Today we are going to talk about the traditional craft of nomads. The topic of our episode is warm energy of felt. Our interviewee is the president of Kazakhstan's Union of Artisans, Aijan Bikulova. Today I'm wearing a silver Kazakh alka with the image of a sheep, our main protagonist today. It gives me great pleasure to share my knowledge. So, previously we were told the legend of how felt came into existence. I have my own version of this origin. You know, there is a felting world star, Salih Girgic from Turkey. He's a felting master in sixth generation, son of the famous Mehmet Girgic. So, Mehmet has a wonderful legend, the Turkish version of the origin of felt, so to speak. Once upon a time, there was a poor shepherd, who herded sheep in the mountains. His life wasn't exactly lining up perfectly, things were not going well. He got tired and upset and started to think about his life. While doing so, he just crumpled a piece of wool in his hands absentmindedly. He was so upset that he even shed a few drops of tears. They fell onto the wall and, as a result of this and the mechanical action of his hands, eventually the felt came into existence. Aijan Bikulova, felt art designer, chairperson of Kazakhstan's Union of Artisans, expert of the International Commission on the Quality Mark program that is part of the World Crafts Council. The artist's works are displayed in museums and private collections in Kazakhstan and abroad. You've been practicing felting for so many years now, and felt has probably already become a part of your life. How do you feel when you hold felt in your hands? Felt is an amazing material. We can talk about its environmental friendliness, the fact that it radiates energy. I think we need to add warmth, so we'll do the edges of the ornament with this thread and do the edges of the piece in pomegranate. At around 11 or 12 o'clock I start laying out the wall, and no matter how physically tired I am, literally in 20 to 30 minutes of work, I notice that I regain some strength. So, felt is kind of like your rechargeable battery that you connect yourself to while working with it. It really has its own special energy. It's warm, it's eco-friendly, it's disinfectant. So, as I understand, it's hypoallergenic. Hypoallergenic indeed. During the World War II, when there was a shortage of antiseptics, they used burnt felt to treat wounds.
We've discussed some legends with you that several countries claim to be the birthplace of felt, right? But from a historical point of view, which of them might be true? In which country and where exactly felt came into existence? In any case, felt originated where there was an abundance of sheep. The mere presence of a large number of sheep and cattle requires constant movement. So it's only natural that felt could not have been invented by people who had a sedentary way of life. So it could have been invented only by nomads. And Kazakhstan indeed has the right to be considered as a birthplace of felt. Everybody who comes into contact with felting at some point feels within themselves that this is a connection with their ancestors, because they feel that this is something so native, so clear and comprehensible. For example, when I first went to a master class, it was the very process itself that hooked me. And you wonder how it all works. How does wool suddenly transform into some product? How does it acquire a form? This form can be changed, it can be decorated. And over time, when you've mastered all the techniques, you start digging deeper and deeper. I, for instance, have been practicing for almost 20 years, and I still cannot stop experimenting and learning. One ornament can be arranged in so many ways. It can be appliqued, or, on the contrary, the bases can be cut, and you have the oyu, which in Kazakh is the ornament that is carved. In eastern Kazakhstan there are famous Berel burial mounds, which were left behind by the bearers of the so-called Pazirik culture, typical for the territory of the Russian Altai. And here is an interesting thing. Felt products were found in both those locations, although geographically they are located quite far from each other. I think that undoubtedly these nations had common roots. It can be seen through the themes and ornamentation, even in those felt products themselves. Moreover, if we consider the Pazarikh and Beril felts, we can say that these were not the first samples. These were the felt made at the highest level. There is a modern technology for making felt, and there were ancient ones. Was there or is there any difference between the two? Or have those same technologies been preserved for 1,000 years and are used today? Nowadays, felting is probably one of the most sought-after crafts in the world. There is not a single country, except perhaps Africa, where felt is not made. Felting is practiced in India, England, Sweden, Norway and so on. Relatively recently, in Japan, they have discovered some engravings, which demonstrate the most ancient way of making felt. What it means is that felting was common and quite widespread, but it still has ancient roots in nomadic culture. A huge number of new techniques exist nowadays. It's Nuno felt, it's needle felt, that is stabbing felt. There is also laminated felt and felt made using the shibori technique. Many famous felt artists try to invent their own new techniques. I also have some of my own developments. But no matter how advanced and modern methods could be, nomadic method, that is, the method used by our ancestors, is highly respected and given the priority around the world. And this kind of felt was impossible to create alone. Istvan Vidak, an international felt researcher, has a wonderful expression. All it takes to make felt is wool, water and human hands. Although, it still takes a lot of hard work. Are there any specific rules on what the source material should be? Good question, because this question, if you explore it deeply, gives you an understanding of the foundation. First of all, the method of rolling, and second of all, of obtaining felt with different properties and different appearance. For example, 
The Kazakh used the felt from the autumn wool cut and the felt from the spring wool cut because they sheared the sheep twice a year. Spring shearing felt, that was usually cut in May, was used to make blankets, to create yarn and for some other needs. Fall shearing gave a shorter fleece, but it was cleaner and probably shinier. There was also another type of wool cut, the summer shearing. But the summer shearing cut the wool off lambs to get snow white, perfectly soft wool for some special occasions. For example, to use it in a Hans yurt or to make a hat for some rich person. And for such occasions, they use the wool sheared from lambs in July. Men oversaw the procuring of raw material while women were in charge of felting. Is that right? Men mostly worked on maintaining the fire in the cauldron, bringing hot water and helping during some of the processes. But they were not allowed to be present during the pattern spreading, nor during the opening of the roll. In general, this process was considered to be sacred, and not even every woman was allowed to be involved in the process of felt creation. Initially, of course, people were using natural dyes. They used the well-known onion husks, pomegranate peel, the peel of coniferous plants, henna and matter roots, which can be found in the steppe. Even the birch tree leaves give a certain color. Later on, with the invention of aniline dyes, which simplified and quickened the process of dyeing, Kazakhs switched to aniline dyes. What makes natural dyeing so interesting? If properly dyed, the colors do not fade out for a very long time. And the samples from Birel and Pazarak cultures are the perfect examples of this. Their colors are still preserved in their original beauty, while aniline fades out in the summer rather quickly. Nowadays, the whole world is striving for ecology, for a return to some traditional techniques. I hope that we will also return to the roots and more and more craftsmen will be involved in the natural dyeing. Изготовление войлок это достаточно серьезный процесс, физически тяжелый, длительный процесс. Production of felt is quite a serious process, physically demanding, difficult and time-consuming. Felt is almost never forgotten. It's constantly being worked on. It's interesting when the felt is pressed quite tightly, but not all the way. This is a so-called pre-felting. If you are making a tikkime carpet, you use the dark wool for the pre-felting. Dark wool is very stiff, it's an aggressive wool. It gets through all the layers, it comes out to the surface. And due to the fact that it gets through all the layers of wool, it binds the felt properly and makes the felt dense. That's why tikimet looks blurry. It has such fuzziness, even a watercolor quality. Tikimet is one of the types of a felt carpet. What makes it different in the first place is the color and also details and theme. По деталям, по тематике. Женим, да, две части вставляем. We're going to join these two parts here and put the cutouts parts together, and then you can see how the two colors will combine with each other. The most important thing is to align the patterns correctly so it does not go astray. Sarmakh and Tikimet use the same ornaments. Nevertheless, the difference between these products is like heaven and hell. When Tikimet is made, the ornaments of a different wool color are spread over the main background, and the felting process begins at the same time. If you make a sarmakh, the process is different. The main layer of the wool and the ornaments are felted separately. Then the ornaments are spread out upon the prepared felt and quilted. Why is it done this way? Firstly, to make the product dense and warm. And secondly, to prolong the shelf life of the product. There are sarmaks that have been stored for a hundred years. In general, there is a variety of sarmaks, and they have different purposes. 
Thermax for traveling, for festive occasions. There is also one for the front part of the yurt. There is the Mayausa Thermax for kneeling. This Thermax here is the Mayausa. So there are different types depending on the purpose and their use. And how to differentiate between the Kazakh Sermak and the Kyrgyz Sherdak? Their difference is probably purely ornamental, although stylistically they're quite close. So the names Sherdak and Sermak are names of the same product, just as much as Tikimet in Kazakh language and Alakiyas in Kyrgyz language. The Mongols also have their own kinds of sarmaks and felt carpets. However, they are completely covered. They do not have combinations of different colors of felt. They usually create monochrome felt carpets and only incorporate some patterns through stitching. Speaking of such a long and complicated process of felt making, is it possible to hold some shamanic rituals for good luck? After all, the ritual includes shamanistic conjuring, the rhythmic striking on a tambourine. Prior to felting, wool needs to be sprinkled with milk. It was obligatory that the leading master, or the most experienced one, or the eldest resident would give a blessing to everyone. And another point worth mentioning, not every woman was allowed to join in this ritual, because it was believed that the woman should be clean and of good thoughts, which would result in the felt that would serve long and would not fall apart. For the process of felting to go properly, for it to be rhythmic, the leading master made special sounds like opa or some others. And at this particular moment, each master sets the rhythm. The felt was one or two centimeters thick, depending on whether it was made for the wall or for the floor. But here, in addition to thickness, we also need to talk about the density of the felt. A super dense felt does not leak. To get a felt of such high density, it is rolled for more than one day. After rolling it the first day, it's left to dry, and then the next day they pour some boiling water on it and roll again. And so, the procedure can be repeated two or three times. The movement of our Wheel of Time suggests that many significant events in the lives of our ancestors were associated with felt. For us, felt is our everything. It's the material that accompanies us for the duration of almost our entire lives. The story about felt will not be complete if we do not look at it through the lens of today. If we do not take urgent measures, this moment to save and restore the traditional method of felt making, we will soon witness it only in museums. Is the situation that extreme? What measures should we take? First of all, we probably need to grow the acnathrum plant. That's one thing. We should also help the felt master to create workshops, to support them during these initial stages. How many felt masters are there nowadays? This is the question that worries me all the time, because I collect statistics and can say that in Kazakhstan's Union of Artisans alone there are more than 40 felters, and the number of our like-minded people is growing. Tell us about the possibilities of felt, which are known only to masters such as yourself, who are deeply immersed in the subject. Felt is absolutely different. This material can be as thin as silk, even transparent. There are yurt felts, thicker and dense. Felt can also be flexible. That's why each master has their own specialization. This chapan is made of thin felt. The layout is very thin and laminated with silk, because it gives the fabric density and provides stability. The decor is applied by a method of applique, which is a traditional one. The motifs are floral, because Kazakhs have always used floral patterns in their clothes, although they were usually made using embroidery. 
Here we are imitating embroidery with felt applique. It's a completely different technique. Here we also have a thin felt, but in this case we cut out the basis itself. It is what we call the oyu. There are floral motifs too, and the ornament is shown and highlighted using silk, which we use to laminate the inner part. So, on the inside we get silk, but on the outside it comes out as an ornament. This is my own original development. When thin felt is laminated over chiffon, an ornament is cut out of the main fabric, and it also shows up in the silk version. This fabric can be worn two days, because when it's inside out, the reverse side also looks really nice and presentable, but in a different kind of way. It has a matte pattern here. If, for example, on this one we have chiffon, then on this side we have fibers. This dress is weightless, it weighs about 100 grams. I know that Kazakhstan's Union of Artisans invites some masters from abroad to visit from time to time. In 1996, during my stay in the United States, I bought a book on felting. It was in English. I encountered the works of several incredible masters in there and really wanted to meet them and learn something from them. So, from time to time, we do try to invite internationally renowned masters to Kazakhstan. In 2022, we organized the International Felt Festival called The Hymn to Felt in Almaty. And for that special event, we invited Janis Arnold from the United States, Mikhailo Vetro from Hungary and Salih Gergic from Turkey. These are the people who have devoted their whole lives to felting. We know that you are preparing an exhibit for a museum in the United States. Can you tell us more about that? This is not our first trip to the United States, but nevertheless, it is a very, very important trip for us. We're going to participate in the exhibition at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. These are some of the pieces coming from our collection at Kazakhstan's Union of Artisans. However, even though we have a significant collection, we have decided to prepare some individual pieces for the upcoming event. With Tamara Khapkhaza, one of our leading felt masters, we are preparing a collection of sarmaks and tikimets. Here she's going to hook it in a few places so the ornaments don't shift. Where does the historical basis end and modern design art begin? Or is it inextricably intertwined with felting? I employ traditional techniques, but the plots and motifs that I use are usually incorporated through my vision. That is, I don't try to make direct references to traditional clothing, I just use the elements and philosophy that our ancestors used before and make my own interpretation. I make a new version of the fabric or stitch or embroidery or I pile it with felt. That is, I have to make sure I put my own effort into it. If someone says to you, we live in the age of nanotechnology and you promote your felt, which is hopelessly outdated, what would be your reply to this person? There are small nuances that we have and when we lose them, we lose our identity, our national code. Nanotechnology has no national face. And the world is interested in a nation with its own face and unique identity. We have our own markers, our own national code, which we should be proud of. We cannot lose it. We have already lost so much of the deep philosophical heritage of our people. What is left for me to add is that the unique material created by our ancestors thousands of years ago will never lose its vital power. 
Felt has been giving us its warmth for a long time and will continue to do so in the future. And all these talented artists, designers and felt masters who continue the traditions established by our ancestors are the proof for that.